Good morning, and welcome to University Community Presbyterian Church on this beautiful morning where, as it says on the front of your bulletin, we invite all to faith in Jesus Christ and growth in discipleship through word, prayer, and service. I'm Carol Nielsen, Deacon of the Month, and we are fortunate today to have as, I guess, kind of a guest pastor, our own Reverend Charles Brower, who will be speaking to us. Um, and we have a number of things happening this week, which are in the bulletin, including the woman's Bible study tomorrow, <laughs> Monday, in the narthex at one o'clock. So we hope to see you there. Um, visitors should fill out the yellow card. People with prayer requests can write them on the, um, you know, the clipboard that Jerry was carrying around, or you can present them at the time we pray. So, announcements. I have two. Um, we have a congregational meeting. Uh, May 21st, right after the worship service, and it'll be short. The purpose is to elect a new elder and a new deacon, and nominated by the nominating committee for those positions are Pat Babcock as elder, and Will Haight as deacon, and we'll be also taking nominations from the floor at that time. Also, um, the session meets every month, almost without exception. Traditionally, it's the third Thursday of the month. Members of the congregation are welcome. And um, I just wanted to let you know the uh, announcement is flashing by on the screen. And um, if you have comments to give to the session, that's a good time to do that. Are there other announcements? A memorial service for a dear friend, Mark Ortiz, will be at the First Presbyterian Church here in Fairbanks, Saturday, May the 20th at 4 p.m. Is there anyone to speak for focus on mission? Okay. Well, let us prepare for the word with the call to worship. Please stand if you can. God has set apart those who are faithful. Our creator will hear us when we call. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. We are here to remember Jesus Christ. We want to be like God. Our faith strengthens, strengthens us for each day's living. God empowers our ministries of caring. Good Shepherd, we meet in your name, confident that we are known and loved by you. Here we draw close to one another and to you, expecting to be empowered by fresh insights to live as your people. We want to care for one another in life-giving ways. We seek to reach out to those who deny you or suspect us. Help us grow in love that is genuine in its caring and self-sacrifice. We embrace the wholeness you offer, 
and dare to risk acceptance of a healing role for ourselves and this faith community. Equip us for service beyond this hour of meeting. Amen. The hymn of praise is UCPC 10, Here I Am to Worship. And that is in that little loose leaf book uh, or on the screen. seated. Oh, I guess that's wrong. You're supposed to keep standing. <laughs> All of us have taken vows of loyalty to Jesus Christ. We have made promises in words that we have not lived out in truth. We have too busily pushed aside God's commands in favor of our own desires. We are more interested in pleasing ourselves than in pleasing God. Let us return to the one who is our origin to reattune ourselves to God's intent for us. The unison prayer of confession is printed here. O oh God, we have ignored our origin in you and denied your rule of the nations. We have pursued illusions of self-interest rather than abiding in your love. We have turned away from brothers and sisters as if they were enemies to be hated. We are afraid to love those who differ from us, who have the power to harm us. We hesitate to take risks of caring for fear that we may be hurt. Discipleship seems too demanding. O oh God, release us from our fears and failures to trust your love 
and live with full generosity. Amen. Hear the good news. By the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are restored to wholeness. God's love will abide with us as long as we share it with others. Our souls will be fed when we focus on feeding others. We will be empowered by prayer and generosity. We will now share the peace of Christ with one another. As the forgived and redeemed of the Lord, let us share the peace of Christ while standing in one place. Oh, well, I just keep them at home because I have uh, copies, but he lost his, so I just keep them at home. Are you serious? Hello. Okay, let me see. Ooh, what do you got there? Can you see anything in that? Does it show you a picture? Doesn't really, does it? It's a jigsaw piece, isn't it? What about you? Can you see a picture in that one? You can see a little picture. Can you hand one to your friend there? Okay, that'll do. <laughs> so, you see, right, well, just keep. What, what you've got there is a little picture, isn't it? But you can't see the big picture until you put them all together. Isn't this the big picture? And you have to work to put them all together. So my message to you today is that sometimes you get little things, and all you can do is to try and fit them together, but there is really a big picture. Now, if you look over there at the banner that you've been putting raindrops on, each one of those raindrops is like your jigsaw piece, that shows you a very small part of the picture. But if we put all those raindrops together and put that money into the money that's contributed by a lot of other churches, then we get the big picture. And the big picture is that we help people who are hungry, that we help people who have no homes, and that we help people who need help because they are sick. And that's the big picture of all the little pieces that are up there on that uh, banner up there. So that's the message for today. Are you going to pray with me? You put your hand on my hand. You can do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day and for the nature of the wonderful gifts that the people have made in this church, all supporting the big picture that we help people who are in need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, you can go back now. Back. Thank you.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5, page 505 in the Pew Bible. This is a prayer and praise for deliverance from enemies that is a Psalm of David. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Two-third three of the, New, of the New Testament. Like newborn babies, grave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow in your salvation, now that you have, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they are destined for. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possessions, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of God for the people of God. I will start this morning with a salutation from the letter to the Galatians. A good way to start Sunday morning. For those of you who join us on Tuesday mornings for Bible study, the men's Bible study, we're studying Galatians, and this was a wonderful passage to start with. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
You may wonder about the this title for my sermon this morning. Is there hope after all? I used to tell my story once upon a time. I haven't told it in a while about my times growing up in a boarding school. The injustices people have inflicted on some of us. But here I am, a pastor, living a good life, loving the Lord Jesus Christ. And I used to end that little homily that I used to have that, that with, the, with, the, with the words, there is hope after all. Psalms 31 considers God a rock fortress where we may find protection. Peter speaks of a cornerstone upon which the church is built. He refers to it as living stones. The stumbling block of our scripture in 1 Peter may be tied to the gospel where Jesus says too plainly for some, no one comes to the Father except through me. These weeks following Easter are a great time to remember that God is continually at work in our midst and is ever building the character of a church and the individuals who follow the way. God is indeed continually at work, changing us, calling us into spiritual ministry. As Christians, we have a living hope made sure by our risen Lord Jesus Christ. His resurrection is a sign that we too will be raised to new life. His Holy Spirit given to us is a guarantee that God's life is flowing through us and will keep us safe. Hope is an interesting word, isn't it? We use it in all sorts of situations. I hope my team will win this week. I hope I get a right to church. I hope I pass my exams this week. We even use the phrase hope against hope, which usually means that we might be in a hopeless situation. I would guess that hundreds of people bought tickets guessing when the tripod in Indiana will fall hoping to win, but of course, there will only be one or two or maybe a few, at most, winning tickets. For all the rest, it's the lost hope. So our question today is, where does our hope lie? Today's scripture offers hope. This is different from what I just mentioned. Is that the sort of hope that we have? Do we understand what it means? Let us look at the passage again and see if we can find out. First, let us think about the people that this letter is addressed to, the letter of St. Peter. Peter describes them as exiles. These are the churches of what is now modern day Turkey. Do you remember how in Acts 8 a great persecution arose in Jerusalem against Christians and most of them had to flee? In Acts 11:19, we read that those who were scattered traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Eventually, the largely Jewish churches that sprang up in these parts of the world became known as the dispersion. As we read through this letter, we realize that these churches were about to experience another outbreak of persecution, both from the government and their neighbors. They were in danger of losing hope, of wondering whether it was worth persevering in their faith, whether the suffering they were about to experience was worth it. Peter rises to encourage and reassure them and he begins by reminding them of who they are. 
Peter writes to encourage, reassure them. He says they have been chosen and destined by God the Father, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with blood. Here's his first piece of encouragement. Persevere. Persevere. Remember, God has chosen you. You are not just a random accident of the universe, far less a random mistake, as some people think of themselves. No, God has chosen you. God has sent you apart for himself. That is what it means to be sanctified. He has given us the Holy Spirit to make that real, to prepare us fit for his kingdom. By the way, did you notice how that happened? Did you see the twofold action? The Holy Spirit to help us to be obedient, but God also allows us to be sprinkled with the blood of Christ. That is, we receive the cleansing from the sin that Jesus' death on the cross made possible. How does that happen? Listen I re as I reread verses 2 and 3. Like newborn babies, grave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow in your salvation that you have tasted what the Lord, that the Lord is good. God has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There is a new aspect to that life, the life that can only be described as a new birth. The old is gone, we have a whole new existence. A remade life, if you will, born again in the image of God as we were always meant to be. So where are, we, where are we and those early exile people going? This new birth that we have is a new future. Instead of being doomed to die and that being the end, now we and those early folks have a living hope that comes about through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus has passed through death to life so that we too know that we will rise again. And if that is the case, if we are now able through the Holy Spirit to rise to a new life then we have something great to look forward to. Peter describes it as an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you and for me. Glory, hallelujah. We often hear of people who died, left their children, all their earthly belongings. Many people might look at those children and think how fortunate they are. But here we read of something that is far greater than any earthly inheritance. The Trumps, the Packers, the Murdochs, Rockefellers may all inherit great amounts of money. But in the end, they too, they too will die. Even if they manage to keep growing their wealth, in the end, they all die as poor as the day they came into this world. Because once we are dead, we do not own anything. But for Christians, our inheritance that Peter writes of will never wear out, will never fade away will never end. It is something kept in heaven 
for you and me. Something to look forward to. That is why Peter calls it a living hope. This is a hope that will never die, will never fade away, and will never let us down. But what about now? How is this a living hope if we still live in a world where our opponents can hurt us, they can attack us, they can do us harm? The issue is not how we are getting along in this world. Peter has a much longer term view than that. He says we are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last day. Our salvation is sure because God keeps our faith secure. Did you hear that? Let me say it again. Our salvation is secure. It is the power of God that protects us through faith. Do you sometimes feel that you do not have enough faith to keep on living the Christian life? To remaining faithful? There is no doubt how these early Christians were feeling. But God assures us that his power will keep our faith strong until the last day when our salvation is revealed. So our struggles point us beyond the present to the last day when our struggles will finally be over. Notice that there is a positive aspect to our struggles now. Through God's power, our struggles also keep us strong by training us. Even those times when we experience opposition, Peter says, it is God proving the genuineness of our faith. One of the things I learned in gym class way back in high school was that if I wanted to get stronger, I had to push myself to lift heavier and heavier weights. When I used to play tennis, I found that I, if I played someone who was a better player than I was, I would improve. It is obvious, isn't it? It is when we struggle against the forces stronger than ourselves that we ourselves get stronger. Some of the strongest people we will ever meet are those who have struggled against adversity in their lives. So our struggles in this world help us to strengthen our faith with God's help, of course. The result being that when we feel our faith being strengthened, we realize we are persevering. That is what Peter means by proving the genuineness of our faith. That our hearts are led to praise God. Our perseverance will lead us to sharing in Christ's glory in the Father's presence. How are we going to persevere in the face of suffering if that is our lot? We have all heard the expression, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Is that how we will persevere? By gritting our teeth and trying harder? By keeping a stiff upper lip? That is how some people try to do it. But I'm afraid that will not work. Eventually, we will come to the point when we find it all too hard. When we will start to question whether we are cut out for this sort of life. Or whether God is still relevant in this life in our 21st century. That is when we need to remember that Christ died for us. He has already made us new. God has given us a new life 
a new life in Christ. He has promised us eternal life with Christ in heaven. Isn't that the good news? We also need to think about the relationship, the new relationship we have with Jesus Christ. He says, you love Christ even though you have not seen him. It is true, isn't it? None of us have ever seen Christ, and yet we find that we love him. That is the work of his Holy Spirit. That work within each of us. And that love we have for Christ means that we will persevere rather than letting God down. We believe in him despite not having seen him. We rejoice in him with an indescribable and glorious joy. Is that true for you? Do you rejoice that you know Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Do you rejoice that he has brought you back to God? Has removed every taint of sin? Has made you righteous in God's eyes? There is a lot to be joyful for, isn't there? If that is not enough. Look at the next thing that Peter says. We are receiving the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. This is happening even now. We perceive within ourselves the changes that are being brought about by God's Spirit dwelling within each one of us. Yes, we still have a long way to go, some of us more than others. But all of us are being changed. Our attitudes are shifting. Our desire to obey God is increasing. Our commitment to God's work is growing. And that is something to rejoice over, to encourage us, to give us confidence that God is keeping his promise to save us in the end. What is it that drives us? What is it that motivates you and me to keep going as Christians? Is it a fear of failure? Of being found out? That is what motivates some Christians. They try so hard to live up to God's standards because they think that if they fail, they might miss out. But that is not what we read here today, is it? We have been chosen and destined by God to be obedient to Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. That sounds like an assembly of God's sermon, doesn't it? Sprinkled with the blood. God has chosen each one of us, not the other way around. God is protecting each one of us so that we will receive the salvation that God has prepared for you and me. We run a race, but it is not a race where there's only one winner. This is not guessing the correct time when the tripod file falls or when megabucks or the Powerball draw happens. No, this is a race where everyone who finishes gets the prize. It is a race where the judge is on the sideline, urging us on giving us strength to keep going. Perhaps we are motivated by the thought of rejoining a loved one. Well, that's an admirable aim, but it is not nearly as great as wanting to be reunited with Christ. You see, that thing about loving Christ, even though we have never seen him, has a reverse side to it. Part of the reason for persevering is so that we will see him on the last day face to face. As Christians, we can lay claim to the one hope that will never be that will never let us down. It is a living hope, made sure by the risen Christ. His resurrection is a sign that we too will be raised to new life. 
his Holy Spirit given to us is the guarantee that God's life is flowing through us and will keep us safe until the end. That is the hope that we have been given. I pray that as you go away from this service today, your hearts and your minds will be strengthened to persevere, to remain strong in your faith in Jesus Christ and confident of the great inheritance that is awaiting each of us in heaven. Amen. Our hymn of affirmation is Sifly Past the Clouds of Glory in the hymnal page 190. Please join me in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Bring your good deeds as an offering to God. Present to the Good Shepherd your firm commitment to care for others in the spirit of Christ. We cannot simply dedicate our money, hiring others to carry out the mission of the church on our behalf. We ourselves are called to give leadership and comfort. The giving that God expects includes our time and talent as well as our treasure. The offering plates are at the back. If you wish to put something in there now while Kathy plays or at the end of the service. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all of ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. How can we express our thanks, O God, for the one who laid down life itself in witness to your love for all people? We are aware that many have not experienced that love. We see their need and want to respond. Use what we offer to you in bring healing and peace to others not of this fold. Draw us together as one flock in the care of one shepherd, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. list for this morning, the joys. Our son got married this week to his longtime girlfriend. What a joy. The joy of Mary Ellen's recovery. The joy that Robins are here, very happy to see spring. The concerns, prayer for Christus and Sarah as they drive through the Yukon and 
head to the low of 48. Other joys or concerns this morning? Surely something good has happened this week. Join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, meet us where we are, all the different places that we are. Some of us greet you in prayer, knowing you are a trusted friend who loves us unconditionally. We pray. Hello, dear friend. Hello, beloved. Some of us fear you. We feel ashamed of our thoughts or actions. We are afraid of your judgments, even your wrath. We pray, Lord, have mercy. Some of us feel invis invisible. We desperately want to be seen, most of all, by you. We pray, see me, God, see me. Some of us are angry. Things keep happening that should not be happening. People starve. Animals suffer. People get shot. Wars rage on. Our planet's green space steadily disappears. And we pray, do something, God. Please, do something. Then we pray, show me how to love you. Show me how to follow you. Show me how to be an instrument of your peace. Some of us are on a hamster wheel of anxiety, racing from one worry to the next, to panic to pause. We pray a mantra. Love me. Dear God, love me. Some of us are weary. We have prayed prayers that were not answered, and we wonder, why are we still turning to you? Why are we still offering you the deepest concerns of our hearts? But where else can we go? Where else can we turn? You may not answer our prayers, but you hear them. So we are still here, still saying, Lord, hear our prayers. Some of us worry about ourselves. We worry about our health, about our body or mind not working right. Through the unnerving diagnosis, an uncertain future, we pray for ourselves for healing, for courage, for adequate support, for pain management, and most of all, for hope. Some of us worry about loved ones, about their physical or mental or, me or spiritual health, about their choices, about our responsibility towards them, about how we can be the most loving support we can be. We pray for our loved ones and for guidance in our relationships. Some of us have 
broken hearts. We pray for comfort, dear God. We pray for the children. As children of you, God, comfort us. Some of us are lonely. We pray, help me, God, not to feel so alone. Some of us are in all these places at once. Wherever we are, God meets us there. In particular, this morning, we pray for a recent marriage, recovery, springtime, a thesis that is complete, the return of the snowbirds to this church. We pray for Krista and Sarah, Sarah as they drive south. We're thankful for Muffy's surgery. We pray for a friend near the end of her life. We pray in the name of your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is page 192, Shine, Jesus, Sign. is alive in our midst, begins life anew even among us. Go now and see for yourselves. We will see the nature of God in those gathered around us. God is ready to stand firm, to stand on the rock, 
That is Jesus Christ. Get ready for that. Stand firm. From there, feel the confidence of those who follow the way, the truth, and the life. Go in peace. Amen and amen. God be with you till we meet.